Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan, also known as the Medieval Genie, and today we'll talk about the Shilt. Now, firstly, of course, I should show you what an actual Shilt is before talking about its purposes and all of that. So, it's basically this. So, around the bottom of the blade of some swords, you'll find, instead of it having a sharpened area, just the normal part of the edge, or a ricasso, a ricasso being a deliberately blunt section that you can sort of parry on at the bottom of a blade. Instead, it not only is blunt, but it actually flares out. So this is something that you wouldn't normally see on broader cutting blades, but it's something you see on narrower thrusting blades you'd see in the later medieval or renaissance period, because otherwise the, the shilt is actually not required, which I'll go into in a minute. But uh, uh, I'll admit that, uh, frankly, in terms of aesthetics, I've never liked the shilt, and I don't like that it is so often used in things like tournaments and is required on training swords so frequently, because my opinion of a shilt is... let's just say it's a word that sounds a lot like shilt, and leave it at that. But, um, functionally, a shilt is still a very useful item. So. Uh, basically the purpose is you start with, like I said, a ricasso, which is that unsharpened part. So it's an area that you can parry on. So if you have a normal edge of a blade, of course, if you're parrying close to the hilt and you're taking a lot of impacts, especially edge parries that you see in many treatises, you are potentially going to take a lot of edge damage and have a sawtooth effect which doesn't look nice. But also it can cause further damage and weak spots as well as cracks and potentially permanently damage or break the entire blade, which is undesirable. But the shilt goes beyond that purpose in that, unlike with broader blades, like I said, that broad blades don't really need a shilt because when you're parrying on the edge, or if you're parrying and you're worried that the blade might slide down to the hilt, or perhaps you're using something like a cross guard to directly take the impact of a cut or thrust, the problem is, of course, the angle is not always going to be exactly as you predict. So what can happen is that if the edge of the opponent's weapon, whether it's a sword or another weapon, goes around, over, in front, or under, behind where you're parrying, it can cause a problem where it can still cut around your fingers. And of course, this is undesirable, especially if the person wielding that sword and defending of it is not wearing proper armour, you know, for whatever reason, maybe self-defence or some sort of a great duel, or maybe they can't afford proper armour in a battlefield, something like that. So, having a broad blade, the broader the blade, the more that edge parry or hilt parry keeps the sword of, or other weapon of the opponent away from the defender's hands, so it doesn't really become a problem worrying about all of that going over, under, or behind, in front. This is, it only becomes a problem of hitting the hands where essentially the opponent is cleverly avoiding even being around the, the blade or the hilt in the first place, at which point that's just, that's not even something wrong with the sword design, that's just a failed parry, that's a problem with the user, not with the tool they've got in hand. So, with a narrower blade, the problem is, of course, as we're getting closer and closer in, it's meaning that where the opponent's weapon meets gets closer and closer towards where the hand is. And to mitigate this, rather than having, you know, you've got various ways you can work around it. Of course, you've got cutting blades, which are very broad. And of course, you don't need to worry about this sort of thing. With certain swords, you have a triangular sort of cross section. So they start broad at the bottom, but then they gradually taper to a very fine point. So they're still more focused on thrusting which was quite desirable in later medieval or early renaissance swords, where, because people were wearing heavier armour covering more of their body, it was less likely in something like warfare to be able to cut and go through somebody unless you caught somewhere very lucky, like perhaps an unprotected neck or something. So instead, you would have to look at doing something like getting into somewhere like the armpits, the visor, into parts of the neck, under the groin, and areas like that. So with those swords that were designed to stab into those weaknesses, of course, the blades got more slender, because that lends itself more to stabbing things, of course. But to mitigate this, 
to keep the blade very slender and great for thrusting, without sacrificing that parrying potential of the broad blade, you get a kind of a best of both. So the main, most of the blade is still very slender and tapers gradually towards that fine point, but at the very bottom of the blade, in just the last couple of inches or so, you have this sudden flared, almost crown-shaped part. And shilts can be different shapes and sizes. It depends on the individual person's preferences. Um, you do see some versions which are a bit more sort of flat and just a sort of squared in section. You can see some versions which actually sort of flare out with almost hooks. And of course this makes for an extra area where you can do some of the actions that we've seen in a treatises, such as in Fiore's tra uh, treatises, where you can see actions where you go around the blade and you can do things like manipulating for grappling, disarming, doing takedowns, throws, or just manoeuvring for something like a cut or thrust. And those same techniques you can use specifically with the cross guard. If you had a crown section on a shilt, you could potentially do those same things a bit further up the blade. So that can be a potential advantage as well. But you also see some versions of the shilt that actually triangulate and then taper down towards that broad part of the bottom. So it seems those types of techniques were not as important because, again, you still have the cross guard which can do those types of techniques perfectly fine. And I've not seen any mentions in historical information that say there was any specific, you know, techniques or methodologies in which you can use that sort of crowned part of a shilt to your advantage as much as other parts of blade. It's not impossible, and I'm not going to say that never did happen, but it's not something that happened often enough to get explicitly written down or mentioned. So uh, that's that part of the shield. And it's also, well, nothing else really. I was going to try to excuse the shield, but frankly, I hate them that much. There's only so long I can keep up the composure. So yeah, cosmetically, they are terrible, but functionally, like I said, they're quite useful. Now, they are quite often seen in modern recreations when you're looking at things like historical European martial arts. Now, this is not because of having slender blades do thrusting. This is because, kind of similar to something like an epee, foil, those sorts of things, having a narrower blade means that it can flex and bend more, whereas a broader blade is stiffer, which is good if you're doing real combat, but for people who are doing friendly sparring and tournaments, this is not desirable. So you'll see it a lot in HEMA, or Historical European Martial Arts, because of the fact that it gives extra weight, and people have mentioned it gives more of a, a real feel of the historical weapons they're based on, rather than feeling like some kind of, you know, sport item. And at the same time, you can still keep... So you've got that extra weight down there on the bottom, and at the same time, you can still have that flex and it's great for doing tempering in a sense that if you thrust or cut at your opponent you want that blade to be able to bend and firstly you want that blade to not snap in half because obviously that's bad and also dangerous because the sharp remnants can potentially thrust into someone and cause a real kill when you're just doing you know a friendly match but also you, you secondly don't want it to bend and sort of fold in half taking a set, which uh, this requires tempering and this is something I've been experimenting with because I'm learning bladesmithing, but um, suffice it to say it can be quite difficult. But designing a sort of a narrower blade, of course when things are thinner and narrower they tend to be more forgiving, I find they tend to bend and spring back into shape a bit more easily, whereas broader blades tend to be stiffer and if they bend too far they just break. So that's probably another reason, so it means that you can more reliably and easily have a sword that's tempered to flex and then spring back to its true form rather than having those aforementioned problems. So that's why there are different reasons why they had a shield historically and why they have them nowadays in your sort of modern scenarios. So I hope that was in useful information, and I can talk about other parts of swords and what their purposes are in other videos. But, until next time, ta for now!